Um, certainly it's a, an interesting part of Adelaide, lots of development happening at the moment. Um, and so our school is a fairly diverse school in terms of its clientele. Currently about uh, roughly 850 students, uh, pegged to grow to 1,200 uh, with the arrival of year sevens, but also demographically. As I said, the area is changing, as you would know, with the demise of Football Park and so forth. It's also, interestingly, an area which is becoming um, progressively, I guess, more middle class over the years. So up until this year, we were a, a, a Cat 5, which was interesting. Uh, we've gone down to a, a Cat 4, but principally, I think, because we've had a, a large increase in, in ATSI enrolments, I think, which is a, a fairly big factor in that. So, it, But it is a, a diverse um, clientele that we work with. And in amongst that 850 students are around about 120 or so students are in our on-site flow program. Our current timetable looks like that. Um, so it's a six-day revolving timetable. So uh, beautifully work, works absolutely beautifully mathematically um, and has significant advantages um, in terms of uh, distributing uh, loss of lesson time over the year. So, you know, you start the first day of the year and day one, next day is day two and so forth, and if you've got a public holiday or a school closure, you, that's a day zero, and then you just keep the cycle going. So it's, it's had its advantages. Um, because I know there's a lot of timetables in the room, I'm sure you're all thinking, ah, but what about? And there are issues with that, and we've been uh, dealing with that over a number of years, and um, we made the decision that we would change from that to a, a new structure when it made sense from a curriculum point of view, which is what we're, what we're doing for next year. So, I mean, the, the thing that's probably the, the, the worst nightmare for Sue here, who does most of the, the work in manipulating the timetable, is that's a nightmare for part-time teachers, for, for starters. So that's just a very little bit about the school. Um, school priorities. We are... Uh, one of the five entrepreneurial specialist schools. So along with those schools, we went about um, working through with a consultant our, our vision uh, for what we expected to and were aiming to be by uh, 2030 as an entrepreneurial specialist school. And 2030 was seen as being far enough away to not be an immediate issue, but not so close um, that we needed to you know, start doing things straight away. So. I'm certainly not going to go through all that, but you can see some of the, in highlighted there, some of the things which are driving our work in the curriculum space around re redefining uh, the nature of the education experience, seamless relationships with the community, vibrant hub, student agency, uh, richer experience, more flexible curriculum, assessment aligned with the drivers of success, lifelong learners, and I'm sure they're all things which are very familiar to all of you, but that statement has been very instrumental in the work that we're doing um, across the board in our teaching and learning, which certainly in what's driving where we're at with the timetable structure we've ended up with. Um, obviously, we're not just um, working on our entrepreneurial focus. We all have um, department priorities. So while a lot of what we're talking about is different approaches to learning and very much a, a focus on uh, capabilities and dispositions rather than uh, coming from the perspective of content, that doesn't mean we're not looking at increasing student outcomes. And our site plan uh, um, goals are, the, well, the first one is probably the most significant one around increasing the proportion of students that maintain, achieve at and maintain in the high le uh, band levels. Um, I popped up some quotes from uh, a variety of sources of things which have influenced our thinking over many years. When I say a variety of sources, I think on reflection most of those are Yong Zhao or a, an amalgam of those. So uh, education is not getting ready for life, it is life. Uh, when we let go, it's amazing what students can do. Uh, when connections are strong and integrated and uh, learning within and across subject areas because it helps us make sense of a world where um, ideas intersect and knowledge is not in boxes. So we're, when I show you the structure later, it's very much around uh, not dividing this, the timetable and the, the curriculum up into little packages of learning. It's more of the integrated approach. And we create value for ourselves by creating value for others, which is a very um, Yong Zhao, uh, it, one of his major priorities. And certainly it's been influential in our thinking about entrepreneurial education.
So what does that mean for curriculum pedagogy and wellbeing? Again, I've just popped up some um, a, a, an excerpt from a, a document that we've used to influence our thinking and, and again, just highlighted some key phrases and under these, those quotes. So organising the learning areas around key authentic questions and tasks, decentralising the role of the teacher, multiple entry points to learning, uh, students who take greater control of their learning, student agency, de-emphasising subject labels, critical, critical and creative thinking skills, problem solving skills, transferable skills, and new contexts and students see beyond themselves. So one of the things that we wanted to break down was this notion that if you ask or if a student says to teacher X, uh, why are we doing this? We don't want the answer to be because you might need it one day. We don't want the answer to be because that's part of our learning at the moment. You're doing authentic work at the moment and, and working towards authentic outcomes and authentic products. Uh, what does that mean in terms of um, pedagogy and wellbeing? So the pedagogy and the wellbeing in particular are about creating the conditions to allow that to happen. Um, so when we've worked with staff around the notion of decentralising the role of the teacher, it's not the teacher standing back letting the kids do whatever they like, it's around the teacher being purposeful around planning the teaching and learning so that the students have control but the teachers are there to guide and, and, and work with the students and to make sure that the content is still covered because while we're de-emphasising and not having the content as the starting point, Clearly, we still have to make sure that the content is, is covered. In terms of um, well-being, um, we have very much a cascading um, um, model for well-being, where teachers uh, themselves take uh, a role in the well-being of the students they work with. We've had all we're in the process of uh, doing the Berry Street training with our staff. Uh, we've had all of our staff involved in the uh, strategies for, for managing abuse-related trauma, the SMART program, uh, and a program which we've run for many years, uh, came out of uh, Western Australia a number of years ago, CMS, um, Classroom Management Strategies. So they're all around producing uh, the skills that the teachers have in terms of working with students to create a safe and accountable learning environment uh, and then when, if necessary, wellbeing issues are escalated to the next level, which would be uh, counsellors and, and year level uh, managers with a, with a wellbeing focus, and then if need be, or when needed, into our wellbeing hub, which is a combination of leaders in the wellbeing space and also uh, youth workers. Uh, and we also want to make sure that one of the key things, although it's only one dot point there, is that teachers uh, employ dialogic approaches. So it's not about teachers uh, pronouncing uh, and delivering the content, it's about uh, working with the students to extract uh, the learning in terms of the way they go about their pedagogy. So what does that mean in terms of the structures that we're working with uh, across the school? I um, have to be relatively brief here, and this is a, a journey that's taken many, many years and I'm certainly not going to try and explain um, all of this diagram. Uh, but this diagram maps out the, the whole of the, the curriculum from 7 to 12 and in fact from 5 to 12 because we do a lot of work with our feeder schools with students from year 5 coming in to do various activities in terms of our um, working with our, our experts in a variety of spaces. So uh, the complexity there uh, is the way that we structure the, the curriculum around packages of learning. And I'll give you an example of, of a couple of those in a moment, but also around how we are packaging, or will be packaging up the learning in terms of year seven and eight uh, curriculum once that, um, once the year sevens arrive in, in a couple of years time. And the other thing that I wanted to uh, refer to in this diagram before I move on is in uh, green up there is the, uh, no, green is the timetable, just below that is a whole school career um, education strategy. So we see that as a, an overlay of all of our um, curriculum, right from uh, the early years, the middle years, all the way through to year 12. And it's around students and, and being supported to identify 
their passion and purpose in terms of education and using that to guide what they would like to be doing and what they intend to engage with, not with the notion of what do you want to do when you leave school, but what are you enjoying doing now, what are your passions now, what do you want to develop now, and, and working with that uh, to expand to what that might mean as you get closer to the end of uh, the secondary education. Now, this is a, a diagram of our proposed year seven, eight structure, which um, somewhat concerningly, someone, when I showed it to the school council the other night, governing council, someone said it looked like a COVID virus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it, yeah, hopefully it's not. Um, but basically what, what that shows is our, our structure for year sevens and eights will be around learning nodes. So we've got on the right hand side of the diagram, uh, the learning nodes of uh, global and local uh, perspectives, which incorporates English, Hass and Lote, uh, physical and natural world, which incorporates uh, math, so, uh, maths and science, and they will continue to be as they are now taught by a single teacher. Uh, and there's the opportunity for interaction uh, between those nodes and also to the other nodes, which are the other three that you can see there, the arts, hothouse, health and happiness, and uh, the design domain. So rather than looking at the year seven and eight or middle school curriculum uh, and doing the traditional things that we do in secondary schools of saying, well, we've got all these subjects, we need to give this many lessons to this subject and this many to that subject so that students get a taste of everything. Uh, and then they can you know, gradually whittle that down as they work through secondary school and specialise. Uh, we've taken it from the, the uh, perspective where rather than have choice by um, subject choice, they'll have choice within those nodes. For example, uh, in the arts hothouse, they'll be working uh, in a node with a group of teachers and a large group of students, and those teachers will have a range of expertise in the arts, and between them as a group of students and a group of teachers, they'll come up with an authentic product that they want to work on, and the students will be able to have um, some say in terms of their what they want to specialise in terms of the arts in that space. So the choice comes from uh, identifying what they uh, are interested in and what, they, what really resonates with them in terms of what they want to be doing in the art space rather than us saying we well, need to do a bit of dance, you need to do a bit of drama and a little bit of art and then you can decide afterwards. Uh, and not only will they have some choice, they'll see all of those things in action at once. So we, th we think that's a, a, a good model. Uh, also, I just mentioned briefly, uh, represented by the orange uh, triangles in the corner of that diagram. We've int we're int we will be introducing two new subjects, one of which, at the, one of which is the start of year seven, uh, called induction, uh, immersion and connection. So that will be a, a subject where the year sevens will come in and do some work again on authentic contexts and problems around developing the skills, the dispositions, uh, and the, the attitudes that we think will help them to be successful as a, as a student of the school. So that'll be a full semester subject. Uh, and at the end of year seven and eight, the last semester of year eight, they'll undertake another subject called personal venture, which will allow them to have some choice around how they want to work in terms of those nodes. And then again, in an area of passion, which will lead directly into some of our entrepreneurial uh, packages that I'll show you in a moment. So that's um, taken a long time to get to that stage um, and it's a lot of work to be done or has been done and will continue to be done with staff around what that looks like in terms of how do you work as a group of teachers with a group of students and uh, um, resist the temptation of just dividing it up within those nodes of I'll take you for music for a few weeks and then uh, you can take them for art for a few weeks and then we'll decide later. It needs to be an immersive uh, uh, program. Um, in the, sec in the um, senior school space, we've done a lot of work on whole day immersive programs, um, which are packages of safe subjects uh, undertaken around a central theme um, and all that happen on a full day. So this is, I'll, I'll show you what this one looks like. This is our most long-standing one that's running for this third year this year. It's the UAV or the drone program. So it consists of uh, stage two design and tech subject, stage one scientific studies, and the students undertaking that 
uh, do their remote pilot's license and their nautical radio oper operator certificate, and we collaborate with the Uni of Adelaide in that, that space. So at the moment, that happens on a, a, on a Wednesday, uh, and they work on that, not in subject packages, they work on uh, solving particular problems, and the, the teachers have structured the learning so that it incorporates all of the, the learning outcomes for those subjects and the, the, the remote pilot's licence. And in fact, they were supposed to be going to uh, Kangaroo Island today to do some of their the work there around weed control, but unfortunately, uh, the weather's not conducive to that, so they're stuck here, which is a bit of a shame. So that happens on a, a Wednesday. Um, and next year, we'll have all of those which are similar packages, which will be a full day package uh, in a whole range of other areas. This year, uh, two of those, the, the top two have been running this year as well, and the rest of them will be new next year. So the sports industry pathways one, for example, is structured around year 12 PE, uh, and, but they also <coughs> excuse me, do a, a certificate in event management, and it's, it's based around um, industry pathways in the sports industry. If you're passionate about sport, but perhaps you won't, become, won't be able to be a, um, an elite athlete. So oh, we also have a significant number of students undertaking full day uh, VET programs through the, the Wasson network. And they are supposed to happen uh, on Wednesdays or Fridays. And we're trying to stick to that as a network, but it's, it's a bit tricky to do that for a range of reasons. But certainly for us, moving forward, they'll be, we'll be trying to concentrate all those onto one, onto one day. So at the moment, what happens in those packages is, as I said, the students for a full Wednesday are engaged in that program, but while they're doing that, the timetable uh, keeps moving underneath that. That rotating timetable still happens. So in, in a sense, that evens out the time that they're not in their other subjects because they, the, the timetable revolves through there. But we've still found that there's a tension between uh, the subject teachers uh, wanting to um, put pressure in it, not in a negative sense, on the students to, to catch up on all the work that they're missing on those days when they're not in lessons and, and maybe to, oh, we've got a test this week, you really need to be there and not at your, not at your UAV course. So that was one of the problems that we wanted to solve in terms of a new timetable structure. Given that next year we've got well over 200, I think it's about 240 students involved in packages uh, across years 10, 11 and 12, I should say, they're, they're multiple year level, not, not single year level. Um, and also a significant number of students in VET courses. So we wanted to come up with a, a structure which would accommodate all of those things uh, and minimise um, that tension in between real subjects and package subjects, because we didn't, certainly didn't want there to be that sort of definition, that sort of distinction, I should say. So this is the model that we've come up with. So this will be introduced next year. So where you see um, eight and nine, this will become seven and eight, and we're still doing some work on um, what it will look like for year nines. We figure we've got a little bit longer to work on the year nine model. So a six line timetable. Um, mathematically, six lines works nicely in terms of maximising the amount of time that you can give staff uh, in front of classes. Uh, but it doesn't work particularly well with enterprise agreements. It gets very close to the edge there, and we've had a bit of um, an issue with that. The other issue we've had with the rotating timetable is that technically that means um, that every staff member is averaging their load. So we had to get an agreement from every staff member that they're happy to do that, which is most of the time there's a lot of goodwill in that work, but, but we did have some issues with that. So six lines. You can see there how the lines are arranged. We've, we've already made some changes to the distribution of those lines in terms of, you can see lines five and six are only in the middle of the day. That was in the first draft. I think we've moved away from that. You know, Sue's nodding, so we've moved away from that just for uh, organisational means. But what, what we haven't moved away from is the fact that you can see there that the lines on Monday are the same as the lines on Thursday and Tuesday and Friday. So that is... Um, conducive to a number of things, including uh, part-time teachers. It works quite nicely for that. We've also got each of the lines appears either on a Monday 
or a Friday, so when we're formulating our calendar for next year, uh, obviously we lose a lot of Mondays where we, we can't have any control over that, so we'll try and even that out so that we days that we have control over we'll have on a Friday, so we try and spread the load for the, the lines across that time. On the Wednesday, um, we have the day where those uh, whole day immersive programs occur, either VET courses or those SACE packages that I was mentioning. Uh, so the students involved in those will have a, a full day in, in those programs. For year eight and nine, um, for want of a better term, core subjects, math, science, English and HASS, have an extra double at that time. So with this, the way that works is the one teacher having those students for either English and HASS or maths and science will see them for a double every day. Uh, for the, the years eight and nine next year. Um, and we also have uh, a dedicated um, time after lunch on the Wednesday for loosely uh, called home group and independent learning. And I'll come back to the importance of inter independent learning in a minute. And then we have an early dismissal. Currently it's on Tuesday, but it will be Wednesday next year where uh, staff will undertake collaborative learning. So one of the um, things about that is because every senior school student is 10, 11 and 12 will either be involved in a, a full day package or, a, um, or they will have Wednesday without a full day package, they'll have lessons which aren't programmed directly with subject teachers. What we uh, used to call and won't anymore study lines because they often tended to be anything other than that. So we've, uh, over the last couple of years, had a program where the last lesson of every day, students have independent learning, where they have made choices about what they would like to be learning or working on at, at that time. Because the students were telling us very strongly that they find it very difficult if they're in a, for example, an English lesson, but they know full well that what they really should be or would like to be working on is their physics because they've got a physics test tomorrow and they want to be working on that. So we're, we're, we've worked on that for a number of years and we're going to have uh, as part of our planning uh, and going back to that subject at the start of year seven will be the first time we introduce it, the notion of scaffolding uh, the development of independent learning skills so that students, uh, we're not just saying here go have some free time off you go, we'll, we'll scaffold with them um, some skills that they need to make effective use of that time. And in fact, we're looking at developing a series of micro-credentials that they can um, gather up as they work through their study lines uh, to enable them to, I guess, for want of a better term, gain, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, uh, they might be able to go home for study, for example, or, or work unsupervised, those sorts of things. Um, so that's the, the structure. Mathematically, it works uh, quite well. I've just thrown up there um, some examples of the sorts of loads that teachers might have. Essentially, and that's only full-time teachers there, uh, all full-time teachers will teach 23 lessons a week. And there's various combinations of how they do that, depending on whether they're core teachers or whether they're taking independent learning or whether they're involved in packages. Uh, and that works quite nicely with um, the, uh, the enterprise agreement requirements in terms of face-to-face um, -face time and, and knit time. Uh, I've talked about the line distribution, um, independent learning I've talked about, and I've talked about the notion of choice. So um, that's some of the key uh, features of that timetable structure. Uh, some trade-offs, there's always trade-offs, there's no, as you all know, I'm sure, no perfect model in any of this. Because there's only six lines to choose from, and even with that notion of using the, the nodes to have choice within the nodes, there are some times when there are issues with choice. For example, if students want to um, do a full year of a subject at year nine, it, it doesn't work out necessarily very neatly, so we have to have negotiated, we will have to have negotiated outcomes um, around that and one of the ways we're looking at that is is um, developing uh, the micro credentialing and focus of um, stackable units of work that students can do to, to, to meet the 
uh, the compulsory nature of um, Australian curriculum and, and possibly through off, offline um, delivery of subjects or online in terms of technology-based subjects. And I think one of the good things, few good things about COVID this year is it's really shown us um, how much you can do um, remotely and still engage the students. Um, regional VET, as I said, is supposed to be on Wednesdays, Wednesdays and Fridays. It's not always. So um, with this model, if, if a students are out all day on Friday with a VET course, they miss a decent chunk of their lessons. So we'll have to work around that. Um, and the last thing there is, are all loads created equal? Uh, and that's the notion of, if I'm a teacher teaching um, three core lines and an all-day package, how does that equate to a teacher who has teaching uh, particular subjects but has a significant load in a uh, supervised study space? And you know, how does that work? And how does home group work in terms of the, the definition of loads? Now, the agreement says they're all the same, um, but we know they're not all the same. So we're, we, we have some work to do in that space. And one of, the, one of the big things we're doing is to increase the level of accountability around what teachers are required to deliver when they are doing a supervised study role. So it won't be just there sitting there watching the students, it'll be around administering some of the micro-credentials that they have to um, accumulate to al allow them particular uh, progress through the study um, lines. So, how am I going for time? It's about right. Uh, that's, that's where we're at, and yeah, been a lot of work gone into that, but we're ready to, to launch into that next year. So I'll, I'll stop there and leave the opportunity for questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Richard. <laughs> Sometimes you've just got to pinch yourself, don't you? You walk into a room and you hear from four principals um, and their deputies around what it is that their school's doing and thinking about for 2022 and we just get gold, gold, gold and gold. So um, thank you for sharing the insights from, from Seton, Richard. Um, everybody at tables knows what to do. Um, some table talk around what, what you want clarified, what you want amplified, um, what didn't you hear that you'd like to hear something about. Um, and when we come back together to hear those questions, seriously, this time, I don't want to be the first person to ask a question. <laughs> Help me out, people. Um, yeah, so the question from our table was just around uh, if you could just expand a little bit on the induction, immersion and communication, doing it a whole semester with the Year 7s. Sure. So, yeah, so the question was, uh, Greg's asked me to expand a bit on the induction, immersion and, and connection uh, semester for Year 7s. So, uh, what, perhaps I'll start by what we don't want to do for Year 7s. We don't want the Year 7s to arrive uh, from, in our case, around about 20 different primary schools and make the assumption that we need to teach them all how to do various things and so they start off with a, a, a fairly bland and boring start to their high school career. We want them to hit the ground running in their subjects. But we do know that there are various things in terms of, uh, you know, working in a secondary school that are significantly different than they are in a primary school. Uh, and there are things that we want to make sure that they're familiar with how to use, like we use Daymap, for example. We want to make sure they know how to use Daymap effectively, uh, Microsoft Teams. Uh, we have a range of graduate qualities. We put a, a lot of emphasis, emphasis on developing entrepreneurial skills. So we want to do some explicit work with all of them around a, a set of um, skills, dispositions, um, uh, sometimes um, processes that we uh, need them to, to get on top of so they can be a successful part of the school. Uh, we don't want it, and what it won't be is like a checklist of, and now we're going to teach you this and then we're going to teach you that, because we don't want it to be um, bland in that way either. So it'll be around a series of uh, authentic tasks so rather than say, we're now going to teach you how to use Daymap or MS Teams, we might say, we're now going to do this particular uh, piece of work on entrepreneurial thinking uh, or lo work in the local community, and we're going to use MS Teams and Daymap to do that with you so that you're learning as you go along. So we want um, teachers in the, in the other nodes 
to know that, that uh, all of their students have gone through uh, some basic developmental work in, in, in those sorts of, uh, that wide range uh, of, of things that we think are really important for them in terms of being successful. So this, to be honest, there's still a bit of work to do in that space. So it's, it's, that's the concept of it, and we still need to do a fair bit of work around uh, how, what some of those authentic tasks are that we get the students to do. Is that useful? We were thinking we'd like you to flesh out a bit more about your transition to from supervised study, that micro-credentialing component, and how you think you've got that figured out. Sure. Um, so, um, if, if I'm a student who's perhaps in year 12, uh, and I'm, I'm not in one of those packages, no, I'll start, I'll start low on that. So I'm, I'm a year 10 student who for the first time finds that um, because I'm doing a package, I pick one less subject on a line, which means I'll have, say that's line six, so I'll have a, a double on Monday and a double on, on Thursday where I don't have a, a, a teacher working with me in a direct sense around the, the delivery of and the work uh, a subject. So we suspect, and I think we're right, that if we just said to the year 10 students, off you go, you've got free time, go for it, that that wouldn't be particularly productive. Um, we, we would also hope that, however, having said that, we would hope that in year seven, eight, and nine, uh, where we will also have a, an allocation of time to, to work independently within class time. For example, our thinking is that um, in seven and eight, in maths and science and English and has there'll be at least one lesson from each of those subjects which is dedicated to independent learning and developing those skills with the students. But having said that, when I get to year 10, uh, they will be with a, a particular teacher as a group of students uh, on a non-traditional subject line and we will develop a range of opportunities for them to engage in um, where they can nominate, a, for example, a, and again, this is fairly early, we've got a bit of developmental work to do here, but they might nominate that they want to do a, a five-week unit on developing particular skills associated with one of their subjects. Or it might be around the development of entrepreneurial skills. But all of them will have to work through um, micro-credentials of uh, independent learning, development of independent learning skills. So as they work through and get those accredited, they'll get to a point where one, they've developed the, the skills that we think are really important for independent learning, but that will allow them, uh, or allow us to give them more responsibility in terms of what they're allowed to do and what they're free to do during that time. So it'll be a bit like a package of things that they have access to, but also that they're all required to do to show that they have developed the skills to be able to work independently. Because um, one of the key things about this timetable is that we know um, that all the learning can't take place just when the, when the students are with the teachers. Um, and we all know that students miss time, miss days for whatever reason. So if they miss a day um, under this timetable, they miss half their lessons for that week. Um, ideally, they wouldn't do that, but we know that they will. So we want to make sure that those independent learning skills and teachers using things like flipped learning and flipped approaches means that even if they do miss that time, they have the ability to, to work through it. So again, a fair bit of work to do still, but it'd be around building up a package of micro-credentials that they can use to develop their skills, but also to provide um, access to different ways of using their, their study time. 